Welcome again to some calm amidst the craziness of the world to Virtual Church. Great to have you with us once more. Hope you're keeping up your prayers for the beleaguered people of Ukraine in these times. I've got my, my little uh, reminder with me there, as Chaz has over there, to keep on praying for that terrible situation. We're actually, though, returning to our series on people Jesus met, and today it's the turn of the paralyzed man, translated as paralytic uh, in my gospel. Unfortunately, those dons and professors in their ivory towers who translate the Bible for us don't sometimes realize with their sheltered lives that words like paralytic have taken on a different meaning uh, in our society today. So I'm in Mark chapter 2. I love this story. I've been to the place where it happened. Quite a number of events took place there. Capernaum. If you ever go there, you, you'll find they've excavated parts of it. You can see the synagogue where Jesus stood, although the building they've excavated is slightly later. It's actually built on top of the uh, synagogue that was there in Jesus' day. You can see the layer of that old synagogue because it's in black basalt rock. Uh, the rock of the area that that's built and you can see that there and look upon the places where Jesus stood and where some of these amazing things actually happened. It's an amazing feeling. Notice in this reading that it refers to Capernaum as home. So we used to thinking of Bethlehem as Jesus' home when he was a small baby and Nazareth as he was growing up with Mary and Joseph but he seems to have made a base earlier amongst the fishermen of Capernaum, because it's a fisherman, fishing village. There's a lovely beach there on the Sea of Galilee. So without further ado, just imagine you're there, and imagine the atmosphere of this place where Jesus is well known, where he comes and goes, and let's listen to Mark chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he'd come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, sorry, a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Well, what a wonderful story. Could you picture it happening? You know, there's Jesus and all the people crowding round him, and suddenly there's some strange noises from uh, over their heads. Some little bits of debris start falling down uh, upon them, and then a hole appears. And there's some anxious faces peering down. Then this strange shape comes lower uh, onto the floor and it resolves itself into the man lying on the mat and the ropes leading up uh, to his friends above them. I, I just think it's so dramatic and so gripping uh, as a story to picture that and picture yourself as they're amongst them. And Jesus just with complete aplomb, not phased by any of this. One of the things about Jesus, isn't it, that he never seems to be phased by 
anything, whether it's storms, whether it's uh, the man with the legion, whether it's the crowds that have come to arrest him, uh, nothing seems to bother him. He just takes in the situation and says, Son, my son, your sins are forgiven. And this is something to do with Jesus' heart going out to this person. What's it been like for him? However long it's been, we don't actually know anything about the progress of this illness, whether he'd always been paralysed, whether something had happened to him, he'd had some terrible accident, whether it was some sort of psychosomatic thing. There's actually a syndrome that's happening uh, at the moment, um, not exclusively, but uh, to a considerable extent amongst teenage girls who just go to bed and shut themselves off from the world and and, and don't move, and nobody knows why it's happening, and nothing physical can be found wrong with them, but something about the way they feel about themselves, and they feel about life. We live in such an age of anxiety, don't we, when so many people feel bad about themselves, and those feelings can render you helpless, even if not on the outside, on the inside. But there's nothing you can do about the terrible situations that bombard us uh, in the world, about a world that sometimes seems to be slipping out of control. And you can seize up inside, I think, when you contemplate those things. But Jesus looks at this man and affirms him. My son. He reaches out to him and he says, your sins are forgiven. Maybe there was some connection between things he'd done or perhaps with guilt or shame, because these things can stay with people for a very long time and poison their lives and their attitude to themselves. Maybe there was something knotting this person up inside that Jesus knew that he had to let go of. Jesus isn't saying here that everybody who is ill uh, is guilty of some sin. Because we looked, if you remember, not so long ago at the story of the man born blind. And, he, and Jesus was asked, his very disciples asked him, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. This was so that the glory of God might be shown in his life. And of course, uh, proceeds to show him God's love through healing. Or on another occasion... There's been a terrible accident, a tower's fallen on, on someone, or even there's been an atrocity. Herod, sorry, not Herod, um, Pilate has had some fanatics uh, killed, their blood mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus says, actually, they, it's not because these were, people were worse than anyone else that this happened to them. It's not because of our sins, because the last thing you need to do with somebody who's really ill and going through all the inner turmoil that comes with illness, all that, is it my fault? Uh, why does God hate me? Why did he let this happen to me? Uh, all the cantankerousness that comes with knowing you're ill puts you on edge and makes you difficult to live with sometimes. Well, with all that going on, the last thing that you should be doing is blaming people. And saying it's your fault, it's because of your lack of faith, it's because you've sinned in some way, it's because you are not worthy that you're ill. Never do that to anyone. If anyone listening is in the healing ministry, make sure you don't do that. You should be affirming that person as a child of God and saying God can deal with whatever you fling at him. Your sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus is saying here. And of course, there's this uh, argument then that people don't like it. Jesus makes clear because some people think that Jesus is o only ever affirmed as the Son of God in John's Gospel. That's wrong. Who can forgive sins but, but God alone? Well, Jesus says, I can. And many other ways uh, we can trace this through Matthew, Mark and Luke as well. Uh, which which we have to do some other time. And there uh, the man gets up in front of them all and uh, everyone is astonished. 
I'd like to go back now to these amazing friends that this paralyzed man had. Uh, think about it. Look, look what they'd done. They carried this man all that way to find Jesus because they thought Jesus might be able to help him. We're hearing that he's doing some amazing things. Perhaps he can help our friend. And when they find they can't get to Jesus, they, they don't stop there. They climb up onto a roof. That can't have been easy. Uh, they must have got some ropes, I suppose, already to, to get him up there. And then, uh, then they actually start digging through the roof. I imagine it must have been partly made of baked clay or something, needed a bit of work to do it. And so uh, uh, they, they lower him down. But the embarrassment of doing this, they had to be a bit brazen, didn't they, to do all that. They had to not care, really, what people thought about them. They probably had a bill to pay. Mark doesn't tell us, nor do the other Gospels, uh, what happened about that. But presumably they owed it to the owners of the house to actually... Uh, repair it, put it all back together again, or pay for it to be done. And the cost of roofers, well, that could be expensive. This is their faith in action, isn't it? They are going out on a limb for this man because they believe that Jesus can help them. And that's what Jesus says. When he saw their faith, or rather it's what he, he does, he does. He sees their faith. He appreciates it. He sees that their faith is more than words, because it's a faith that's prepared to do something, to step out and to do whatever they can to get their friend to that feet of Jesus. So it's interesting that Jesus doesn't rely on the paralyzed man's faith. He looks at their faith. Because let's face it, when you might have been paralysed for years, probably prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing's happened, it's not good for your faith, is it? Well, God hasn't answered me all the other times. Why should I think he's going to answer me now? And that's why Jesus looks to their faith and answers their prayer, acted out in what they've done. And when you think about it, what a great definition a prayer, to bring the people you care about, to bring the situation that you're worried out about and place it at the feet of Jesus. Well, that's a great way to look at prayer. I wonder if we could do that with our friends who are struggling, when we want to pray for them. Could we picture ourselves bringing them to the feet of Jesus? And finally, if that's our definition of prayer, or a possible definition, because there are others that we could use from the Gospels, well, what a great place to be. Think about it, at the feet of Jesus. You know, sometimes to really pray, to really make a difference, we have to stop struggling. This man was paralyzed, there he was, just helpless at Jesus' feet. Isn't that us sometimes? Sometimes when we're battling with sin, we have to accept, rather like people on the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that we have a problem and it's too big for us and we need the help of a higher power. And that's what's going on in that place at the feet of Jesus. We need the help of the, a higher power, and that power is you, Lord. Please help me break this thing that I can't break. Please... Uh, Help me open up this situation where my struggles have been unavailing. Please release me in this ministry which has borne no fruit. To acknowledge our helplessness. I often do this in prayer. Uh, it, for me, it's a very special place to try and get in prayer to the feet of Jesus. I sometimes picture them and myself reaching out to touch or even caress his feet. I picture his feet on the cross, broken, scarred for me to bear my sickness, my sorrow, my sin, my guilt and my fear. That's what he did there. He was made helpless for us. And sometimes we need to come as the very first step just to be at his feet and stay there. 
until we can feel in our spirit that he's done something for us, that he's acting for us, that his heart has changed just as it went out to this paralysed man. And he's going to pick up that situation and do a new thing in it. So make that an aim in prayer, just to be at the feet of Jesus. It's not the only place to be in, in prayer. There's a very powerful next place, which is to be in the hands of Jesus, where we start to be reaffirmed and re-empowered by his touch. And there's an even further place beyond that where we look into the face of Jesus. And we learn to see how glorious, beautiful and wonderful he is, a place of worship, a place of intimacy in the gaze uh, of Jesus. And um, that's a place where we're, we're learning as we worship him, to love him with all our heart. But the starting place so often for us is at the feet of Jesus. And let's try perhaps more often to get ourselves there. I'm going to stop now with some prayer because we talked about prayer. We Let's remember that we're doing this series on people who met with Jesus because we want to meet with Jesus. So um, I'd like you, perhaps after I've finished this broadcast, to go on and pray for people you know and care about and bring them as those wonderful, wonderful friends did to the feet of Jesus. But before we do that, to close this session of Virtual Church, um, I want to just ask that we bring ourselves to the feet of Jesus and get to that place where we can start bringing other people to his feet as well. So let us pray. And as we still our hearts before God, Let's be aware of his presence with us, of his love for us. And let's picture ourselves being lowered like that paralyzed man. Sometimes we do need to be lowered in our own esteem. Learn to abandon our frustrated efforts. And finally, as we're lowered down and down, let's see ourselves at his feet. If you're a tactile person, uh, some of us are, are more visual, some of us are more what we hear, some of us, it needs to be about touch. Then picture ourselves reaching out to touch the feet of Jesus. And as we touch them, we realize that those feet are scarred and broken because of his great love for us. And now let's make our own appeal to Jesus for the situations we're struggling with, for the things that we feel helpless about, And let's take a moment in quiet to try to leave those things at his feet. Let's stay there until we realise, he already realises, he already knows what he's going to do, but until we realise that he's got it, that he's taken that situation on for us. Dear Lord, you know all our needs. You know our hearts. We surrender ourselves afresh to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, just a couple of notices. Um, our Lent course is starting tonight, so I'm looking forward to that very much. Um, do, if you haven't let me know, but you want to come, please do. Uh, come along to St Andrews at 7.30 and we'll be in the Annex there. 
secondly, unfortunately, for various reasons, I can't proceed with the uh, illuminate that is scheduled for Sunday night. So that was going to be six o'clock on Sunday. I haven't been able to get everything together for that service and I've run out of time now. Uh, so the next one won't be next Sunday. It'll be on the 10th of April. And I uh, hope to see you there. We've got a lovely guest speaker coming to that one who is a youth pastor at St. Uh, St. John's in Egham. So uh, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to what she's got to share with us. So until we meet again in virtual church, the Lord be with you, bless you and keep you. Amen.